Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Julie, for that nice introduction, and Madhvi for all of the work you've done to put this training together. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you this morning and to talk to you a little bit about a general overview of what's happening in the state of Nebraska related to long-term care. Um, today, I'll be focusing in particular on issues related to nursing facility level of care, and um, we'll talk about an overview on a number of issues. Um, what I want to share is, this is truly an overview. This is really a handful of issues that we can talk about and maybe touch on that might bring um, some enlightenment to you in some areas that you may not be familiar with, and maybe we'll just add to information that maybe you've encountered yourself in your communities. Um, but we really won't be able to get into a lot of detail. Uh, if you have questions that involve that detail, please feel free to reach out to me after this program. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, you did hear a little bit about uh, Leading Age Nebraska from Dr. Masters, and we do represent nonprofit providers of long-term care. Uh, we serve about 70 members across the state and help with uh, educating their administrators and workers and also advocating for issues related to senior care. Here we go. We talked about this. All right, so long-term care options in Nebraska. Uh, you may be familiar with an array of services that are available in the area of long-term care. Uh, those include um, staying in home for services, which I think is most people's preference, uh, maybe having someone come in and help out uh, a couple days a week, um, all the way to you know nursing facility level of care required uh, because of medical issues and potentially um, even hospice. So um, this slide that I'm sharing with you kind of shows that senior living spectrum. And you can see that there are things related to this spectrum. Uh, level of care and supervision increases as you move to the right on the bottom of this slide. Um, and cost, obviously, is something that plays into a selection of long-term care possibilities for someone. You'll see that as you move up on this slide, uh, on the left side, that cost tends to increase. So uh, in Nebraska, we do have all of these types of of senior care represented. Uh, it really depends where you live and what's available. So you'll see here that nursing home care um, is rehabilitation and 24 hour, hour supervision uh, involves skilled nursing, tends to be one of the higher levels of care. Um, I have a, a friend who has been in the area of long-term care, probably working in that for 30 to 40 years. And one of the things that struck me when he and I first talked about this was he said, hey, I've been doing this for you know a number of decades. And what I can tell you is I can count on one hand the number of people over that time who said, I'd really like to go into a nursing home. Nursing home level of care is something that's required because somebody needs help with medical things that they maybe can't get at home um, or services that can't be provided there. I think that's a true statement for most people. Um, that's the level of care we're going to be talking about today. So, you saw from that slide that you do have a lot to choose from, um, but in Nebraska, that is really dictated by where you live. So, uh, if you're in a metro area, that full array of services may be available to you. However, if you're in a rural location, um, you may have one or two of those services available. You may have none of them available, unfortunately, um, as that's sort of where we are in the state with rural and frontier issues. Uh, one of the things that's considered there, like I discussed, is what are your medical needs? Are your needs such that they can be handled uh, in an in-home setting? Uh, are there people available where you live to provide you uh, in-home care? Um, is there an assisted living that might meet your needs? Uh, do you require a nursing facility and is one available near you? Um, what are your resources? So that's another issue related to care. How will you fund your care? Do you have access to savings? Did you purchase an insurance policy? Are you eligible for Medicaid? Those are all other considerations that go into what type of care you might be able to secure. And then in regard to the resources, how long will they last? 
Um, we have a variety of providers that look at different resource and income information to determine whether they can provide care and if, if so, for what period of time. So uh, I know we have uh, people participating from across the state. And I grew up in far northwest Nebraska in a tiny town, so I know kind of what the rural, rural uh, landscape looks like. I've watched that town since I've left, you know, over the past many years. Decline in population and decline in the ability to provide services. But Nebraska has 80 rural counties that account for 35% of the state's population. More than 50% of seniors 85 and older in Nebraska live in those 80 counties. So what that tells you is uh, we have a large number or proportion of seniors 85 and older who live in our rural counties. Um, the availability of senior care in those counties um, is very hit and miss. And so uh, depending on what a senior's needs may be, they may not be able to actually access those uh, needs, care for those needs in those locations. So this is from the Center for Public Affairs Research at UNO. They have really great data available. You'll see a number of slides coming from there in this presentation. Uh, easily accessible. If you're interested in that type of information, I would suggest go there and look. There's great info. But since uh, the year 2000 in Nebraska, all but nine counties have lost population under age 20. Um, so what that tells us is uh, our aged population is probably exceeding our younger population, and you'll see more on that as we move through the slides. But what it also tells you is in the rural counties, people are not coming back who are young and having families there very often. Um, and so it's a challenge for workforce, for sure, and for being able to provide care to seniors in those locations. So, uh, realistic opportunities, and I'd emphasize the word realistic here. Um, really, you have to assess whether someone is safe to be cared for in his or her own home, and whether there's someone available to provide care locally or nearby. Um, the financial considerations that we talked about include anticipating need for assistance at some point, uh, what are the available resources and income, will the person qualify for assistance, so you really have to look at each individual and determine what is realistic given their set of circumstances. Um, this is from an AARP survey. 90% of those 65 and older would like to remain in their homes and age in place. And that is understandable and I think reflects that desire to be home and be independent for as long as, as we can. So one of the things that plays into availability uh, of nursing facility care in Nebraska relates to uh, long-term care closures that we've been seeing. Over the past handful of years, I would say those have been much more common than what they have been in the past. So we're going to talk a little bit about why are the closures happening, what is the impact of these closures on seniors and their families, and then what is the impact to communities when a facility like this closes. So these are three clips uh, from the past three years. Uh, it's 18, I don't think you can see it on that middle skilled nursing news clip, that's 2019, and then we have 2020. Uh, the 2020 note is really recent, but what you will see is that we have had a significant number of either receiverships resulting in closures or simply closures due to inability to financially sustain a location over the past really three to four years. So this first um, clip comes from 2018, was um, related to a chain of nursing facilities. 21 of them ended up in receivership Many of them ended up closing. Many of them were purchased and, and maybe continued to operate, most of them in rural locations. The clip from the skilled nursing news, um, you'll also see uh, four facilities that after uh, a chain had taken over a number of them, they determined these four needed to close. You'll see Blue Hill, um, Milford, Utica, Columbus, 
So uh, Utica, Blue Hill, you know, definitely rural locations. Um, the impact of this is 205 licensed beds. That means potentially 205 residents who were without a place to live uh, because as you go to nursing facility level of care, that becomes your home, that is your residence. It's like having an apartment, this is your place. Um, and then you'll see that that impacted 204 workers. So between those four locations, 204 workers in a rural setting, that's a lot of folks because it takes a lot of people in a community to support a nursing facility by providing whether it's skilled nursing care, um, dietary, laundry, cleaning, grounds. So um, it really does have a big impact there. And then this third uh, article is from Lincoln Journal Star, that's from 2020, just this last month. Uh, you'll see that we have another facility that is going into receivership. And we'll talk a little bit more about receivership and what that is and why it happens um, here in a bit. But as you can see here, uh, Nebraska has had a number of these in the past few years. So a receivership is a state court court proceeding that enables residents from nursing homes to continue to receive care while living in those nursing homes um, and the ability of a, of a facility to continue to pay their employees and their vendors. Sometimes uh, by the time a receivership has rolled around, um, maybe the entity is already not being able to pay their employees and their vendors. Uh, sometimes that's kind of where the red flag comes up that says, hey, maybe they need a little help. But the key of this is that those residents who are living in those facilities still need to have lunch, still need to have therapy, still need to have a bath. And so um, basically with the state stepping in and taking a role there, they're trying to help stabilize what's happening in that environment to, for the welfare of those, um, of those residents to make sure that they're safe. And in doing so, often the plan is then to help determine what happens moving forward with that location. Um, is it something where someone can step in and help and maybe the entity can resume uh, operations either with someone buying the location or maybe a community taking over the location um, or maybe it's a matter of closing that location, which means that, this, that the residents of that facility have to go somewhere else. And we'll look at some maps here in a bit that will show you a little bit more what that looks like, but that's a very traumatic undertaking for residents, staff, and families. And so um, that is you know, not obviously what we like to see. In Nebraska, this is the statute, Nebraska Revised Statute 71-2086, governs rece the receivership process. There's currently a bill in place to kind of help tweak some of those things. Um, as we've had a number of receiverships going on here in the past few years, there have been portions of uh, that, um, that law that have needed maybe some, some revision based on the actual um, impact. And so uh, that's out there right now. So why do receiverships happen? So one of the reasons receiverships happen is due to funding shortfalls. So on average, a skilled nursing facility will lose over $30 a day when caring for a resident covered by Medicaid. Um, obviously, the legislature uh, is in charge of how that budget looks and also uh, the agency puts forward their recommendations. But at this point in time, a facility that would provide care to a Medicaid recipient would be losing $30 a day on their cost for care. So that means that uh, the staffing that it takes, the, the food that it takes, the electricity, all the things that go into just a normal daily routine for someone, uh, that they're falling short $30 a day on average with uh, covering that cost, which means you know, uh, over a month or over a year, that's a significant loss that's incurred by a facility. And what we'll see is that a number of facilities may limit the number of Medicaid residents that they allow in the facility uh, simply to balance those funding shortfalls. But what you'll also see is that we have a number of very dedicated providers 
who will not <laughs> limit their Medicaid um, resident number and that puts them in a very difficult position because they're unable to diversify their funding stream and they tend to run then at a, at a much larger loss. So community impact uh, is another thing that happens, uh, you know, related to receiverships. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, I will say that this is a little older da data. This is as of uh, the end of 2019. Um, 33 nursing facilities had closed between 2017 and 2019 because management was unable to sustain operations. And, as, and strangely, an additional 33, same number, were under state receivership at that time. So those numbers continue to rise. We're continued, continuing to see anticipated uh, difficulty with some providers. Um, and adequate funding obviously continues to be a big concern. So this map shows you um, Nebraska. You, the outline is hard to see there, but these are, were the anticipated closures so far that we, uh, we were aware of, and this is a couple months old, um, in Nebraska. So you can see that there are, I think there are 14 locations um, represented on this map. So uh, it does seem that this continues to be difficult for providers. So this map I really like. So this is the number of Nebraska nursing facilities by county. This was as of October 25th, 2019. I do want to note this does not include any correctional, tribal, or veterans facilities. This, um, this, they're not included here. But what you can see is we have uh, a handful of counties and kind of a swath here in the middle of the state that have no nursing facilities. We have a lot of counties that have one nursing facility and then as was evidenced by the information we talked about earlier in more of the metro areas you see uh, availability um, quite readily of nursing facilities and so um, that's helpful in sort of assessing the red is kind of a warning but if those if those red counties lose one nursing facility that means the entire county no longer has an option for pro providing that level of care. And so this next slide actually is going to show you what that looks like. So if counties with one nursing facility would have a closure, this is what the state of Nebraska looks like. The black segments are counties with no nursing facilities available. Um, this really brings into question uh, access to care issues in certain parts of the state, certainly they're pretty grave. Um, I think the other issue is these yellow counties, they're go they could go to red. And then you have even a bigger segment, and especially if you look at this northwestern and kind of north central part of the state, that where folks who want to remain in those communities and receive their care really are unable to continue to do so and they can't uh, just go close by to receive care, they have to actually move uh, pretty far away. And, you know, we just, we talked about how 85%, or I'm sorry, how 50% of those 85 and older live in these rural counties. So um, I think that that's a pretty big concern as far as a real impact on people. Uh, I think it's really hard to think about, and especially from growing up in a small town, uh, the nursing facility was a vital part of that community. And everybody knew someone living there at some point in time. And in fact, my own grandmother, grandfather, father, they all lived in that facility. Uh, it was a continuum of care uh, that was available to keep people where they grew up. Sometimes they'd been there their whole lives. Um, to allow them to live with people they know, being cared for by people they know uh, in a familiar surrounding. And I think that there is a lot of value in that. That's not to say that there, you know, that there will be some closures that happen uh, simply because population is declining or occupancy is reducing. That, that is a, a valid thing. So Leading Age National actually did this report. Um, Nebraska participated in it, and this is available online. So if you go to the slides and you're interested in seeing more detail, you can, you can click the hot link here. 
But what this tells us is, you'll see in red, Nebraska was one of the states that was pretty significantly impacted, uh, maybe even, I mean, more than other states. Um, more than half of the 550 closures of nursing homes that have occurred since 2015 um, happened in only nine states. So of those nine states, uh, Nebraska was included. So over half of those 550 happened in those nine states. What that tells you is um, a significant number of the closures are happening there. Uh, in several states, nursing homes are concentrated in rural areas. The closures, the 550 closures, happened pretty evenly between rural and urban locations nationally, but in Nebraska, it happened disproportionately in rural locations. So, uh, as we talked a little bit ago about what the demographics of Nebraska look like and the geography, uh, this is obviously pretty concerning. Um, closures of rural homes do have particularly negative impact uh, on the communities in which they operate. And then if you uh, look at this third point, it's talking about state Medicaid programs and how they vary in reimbursing nursing homes. Um, most do not pay enough to cover the actual cost of care. Um, Nebraska actually went through a, a process this year where the nursing facility reimbursement methodology um, was worked through and there were some tweaks to that that were pretty, uh, they were positive, it was a step forward. Um, however, uh, there was even a little increase by the legislature um, for the total funding. However, that increase was only a tiny chunk of what's really needed to provide the cost of care, to cover the cost of care. And while it's appreciated, we have a lot of work yet to do in that area. Um, so we need to continue to be looking uh, to funding and to prioritizing the needs of our seniors. This report is also from the Leading Age Nursing Home Closures and Trend Report. Um, this is a US map by Nursing Home Closure Tier. And th what this represents is essentially the percentage of, of closures compared to the percentage of currently open nursing facilities in that location. So for instance, if you had 220 nursing facilities, 22 closures would be 10%. So what you can see here is Nebraska has right around just over 200 nursing facilities currently. Um, you can see that Nebraska rated second as far as percent of nursing homes closing compared to nursing facilities that were still open. So you can see that we're part of a red tier here that seems to be a swath down the, down the middle of the United States. Um, obviously, you know, concerning. So I think what you can see here is the trend that Nebraska has had a lot of nursing facility closures. Most of those have been rural closures and that access to care for our seniors is probably becoming an issue. We know it is um, and something we need to focus on. So Leading Age Nebraska partners with Nebraska Healthcare Association on a project called Seniors Speak Nebraska. And this is a website that you can go to and there's a great deal of information there, snippets of facts about different things related to nursing facilities, costs, stories, um, these were two that I, I wanted to focus on a little bit um, because, you know, we talked about early on resources and what you need in order to uh, secure certain types of long-term care. Um, but there, there has been, I think, over the years, a little bit of a stigma associated with the Medicaid eligibility for our seniors. And I think there's a misunderstanding a lot of times about uh, how seniors become Medicaid eligible. And so uh, this Lillian from Crete, and this isn't actually her picture, but the name is right. Um, uh, her and her husband actually had saved their whole lives working steady jobs, but probably, you know, accumulated what they could and were diligent about it. Um, however, they had medical costs. And as we all know, medical costs can be pretty significant. Um, those medical costs included long-term care, which is also very significant. Um, I think, you know, the average uh, monthly cost nationwide 
for a month of long-term care is over $6,000 a month. And it ranges from about $3,500 a month, depending on what type of uh, facility you are in your location, to $11,400 roughly dollars a month. So even uh, if Lillian and her husband were diligent in saving, uh, if one or both of them ended up needing some sort of skilled nursing, their monthly outlay would be between about seven and $22,000 a month. So uh, it does not take long when you are uh, paying that much for care to expend your resources. And that's what we're seeing as folks live longer, even with their savings, that if they need assistance with some type of care, that they are expending their resources, um, even if it's in five years, because that's a fair amount of time and a lot of money, that they are then needing to rely on Medicaid to help fund those things. So uh, I want folks to be aware that, that oftentimes uh, it's not for lack of trying that folks um, will become Medicaid eligible. And so that's the case with, with Lillian and her husband. Um, this other story uh, is Alice. Um, she's from Wausau, and she spent her whole life in the same small town. Um, her local nursing home was forced to close, and she was required to move to a different facility that was not in that community. Um, she said it was very hard to leave her friends and the community where she was born and raised. Uh, I think that's pretty understandable. Um, unfortunately, uh, especially as a part of those receiverships, we saw a number of folks who had to be moved out from locations where they were living. Um, one particular story that stuck with me, um, and it wasn't the only one like this, was a couple where um, the husband was in assisted living and the wife was in a nursing facility and she had memory care issues. And uh, what was really nice was that because they were together in the same town, they could spend, you know, all day together, basically. And so the husband would go over and see the wife and check on her every day. It became part of her routine, which is so important for folks with memory care issues. And um, the assisted living in that town stayed open, but the nursing facility closed. So as a part of the nursing facility closure, uh, the wife was required to move about an hour away into a nursing facility, the closest facility that had an opening for her. Um, and so she moved there. It was very disruptive for her because of her memory care issues. The, the staff was not familiar to her. The layout of the building was not familiar to her. And not seeing her husband every day, obviously, was something that was different um, for her. So uh, along those same lines, the husband is in his 80s. He is not driving. Uh, his kids are not nearby. Uh, and so it's a challenge for him to try and now go to see her once a week. Um, I'll tell you that, that she passed away shortly thereafter. We saw a lot of trauma with relocation in our elderly, in particular those with memory care issues. We also saw a lot of trauma in our elderly who had medical issues, who essentially gave up the will to live when they were separated from their families. That's, that's a real thing. So I, I think that it's uh, something where we need to be cognizant of the actual impact to people. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, okay, we now went from 210 to 209 nursing facilities and look at the data. But we have to humanize that data to understand what is the true impact to the people receiving care. Um, these are like our grandparents, our parents, you know, is that how we would want them treated? And, and I think pretty clearly from my point of view, the answer would be a no. Um, but it's the reality of where we're at right now. So I did touch on this a little bit, but you know, occupancy is declining a little bit uh, across the nation um, as far as people who are going to go in and occupy you know, a, a bed in a nursing facility or room. And so I think that that does play into this to some degree. We have to be honest with ourselves that if there aren't enough people potentially to sustain a nursing facility that we have to look at other options that keep people close to where they want to be. 
Um, and so you can see here that occupancy uh, reduction is a real thing. Uh, that may be in part so, to some degree because people are staying at home longer, and that's good. I think that's what people prefer, but we have to acknowledge it, but still we need to determine how do we help those who need the care. So challenges in long-term care. I have to tell you that as I was working on this, uh, the last handful of months has been uh, daunting at best in the long-term care world uh, as COVID-19 has been out there and as folks try and staff uh, for, for the challenges with that pandemic and as they try to secure PPE, which is unavailable. So I'm talking about things like masks and gowns, basic things that are necessary to stop the spread of that disease. Um, it has been a real challenge. I think it's been a real challenge across the nation. Nebraska is no exception to that. It has been very difficult for our providers. Um, it has tested them. It has uh, brought them to their knees, honestly. And so um, I think that that probably right now is a big thing that keeps long-term care providers up at night. But I wanted to focus on some other components because that is another world of information, um, though these things I think apply uh, in both scenarios. So we did a poll of our leading age members in 2019, and our members indicated that their top concerns were recruiting and retaining staff, Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement, and regulatory compliance, essentially survey events. So um, I noted that this is pre-COVID. I don't think these things have changed. These all apply still in the COVID world um, because they are all challenges just now amplified. So nurses are a really important uh, piece of providing, being able to provide long-term care uh, in locations across the state. And this actually is data from the Center uh, for Nursing Biennial Report. Uh, Centers for Nursing, Center for Nursing has a great deal of good information on their site as well. So if you're, inform, uh, if you're interested in getting more information, I would suggest that. There's a hot link here on this slide. Um, but uh, in 2019, Nebraska's nursing shortage was uh, 4,062 people, 4,062 nurses that we needed really to meet the needs um, of the things where, we, where it was important to have a nurse in a position. Um, it's anticipated that will increase by 2025 to 5,436. So that's not sort of the way we want to see that go. We'd like to see that decrease, obviously. But the fact is, um, in order to do that, you have to have the people to do the work. Um, there were six counties that reported they had zero RNs working in those counties. So you can see those here. And then there were 12 counties that reported that they had zero LPNs working in those counties. So uh, what we also see here is that most of nursing growth has been concentrated in metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. So continues to sort of um, demonstrate what we're talking about here. So demand for caregivers. Um, so RNs and LPNs are obviously critical. Uh, providers in the world of skilled nursing um, and if we could just create and clone them that would be great but that's not how <laughs> that's not the case so the other uh, another really important facet of providing skilled care is related to nursing assistance and so by 2026 uh, nearly 16,000 nursing assistants will be needed to provide care in Nebraska's skilled nursing facilities um, we're, we're seeing an increase there to some degree because life expectancy, uh, you know, has of course increased. We have an aging population that is large in number. And then uh, Nebraska census data reinforces that our baby boomers, um, we will have a surge of them. Uh, and while we have a surge in the number of baby boomers, we'll have almost an inverse number of uh, folks available to provide care. So from 2010 to 2050, Nebraskans age 70 and older will increase by six times the projection of the increase in the rate uh, of population age 70 and under. So uh, you may have heard this called the silver tsunami. That's what folks have referenced it as. Um, 
and it's it's just really an offset uh, in the proportion of ability for the need of care and ability to provide care. So um, here's another slide from the Center for Public Affairs Research and um, really what it's telling us is that the prime age workforce is peaking and will decline for the next 10 years. So if you look uh, at this slide, you'll see the peak of workforce looks like it was somewhere between 2018 and 2019, and now we're starting to see the decline. So um, we'll probably notice that decline in more areas than just senior care, but uh, it is particularly important for healthcare generally that we will see the numbers of folks able to be able to provide the care reduce um, as the years go forward. I thought this was also interesting and it's from the same site. In 2019, the population of people 75 plus, so 75 and older, surpassed the population under age five. So you can see around the same time, and I guess not surprisingly from the slide before, around 2019, 2020, we see the population age 75 and older go up pretty markedly. Um, here, if you look at like 2040, certainly very markedly. And then you see the population of age under five stay pretty steady, but obviously much lower than the population who is 75 plus um, really supports sort of what we're seeing as far as workforce. So our challenges related to COVID-19 workforce, which we talked about, um, lack of funding, uh, meaning the Medicaid payments and reimbursement uh, being lower than the cost of care, and sometimes the inability to diversify. And so let me talk a little bit more about that. So um, if you grew up in a small town or you're familiar with a small town, you probably know that if somebody comes to the door for care, most facilities are going to say, absolutely, you were my you know, history teacher, you were my whatever, baseball coach. And so there's a connection there. Um, the question generally isn't, are you on Medicaid? Well, you need Medicaid. Um, even though at times, at some point, that becomes the case, uh, I think people don't discriminate by funding source as much, and they don't have the ability to do so because there's only a certain limited population who's going to come in for care anyway. Um, we do see larger facilities, in particular in metro areas, being able to either determine they won't take Medicaid at all, Medicaid residents, um, they will take Medicaid, but your first two years has to be private pay so that they can balance their loss. Um, and then what happens is, because there are a lot of folks who need care who are Medicaid eligible, there are a handful of providers who are very committed to providing that care who then struggle um, because they have such a large percentage of Medicaid residents that they uh, you know, have difficulty offsetting uh, multiple numbers of, of uh, folks who they're getting paid less per month than what it costs to care for. So I think that that's a real thing, and I, I don't know how you fix that. I, I understand, you know, there's a business model involved, but um, certainly um, providing care for Medicaid recipients is, is important. So COVID-19 challenges with uh, PPE um, have been that. Um, nursing facilities uh, require the PPE to keep folks safe. As you've probably heard, most of them, based on state and federal guidelines, have been shut down to visitors now since the middle of March. Uh, we have a few that have been able to move into the phasing where they've been able to bring people in in a distance setting uh, with appropriate PPE and often plexiglass. Uh, to, to have those visits or maybe outside, but uh, a good number of folks are still not being able to have those visits. Um, that has impacted uh, the health, mental health and well-being, and actually physical health and well-being of those residents. So one, uh, not being able to be in human contact with your family uh, or, uh, or your friends who come to see you uh, is a big loss because that's often what folks are looking forward to any given day. 
and uh, actually we started to see reports from a number of folks where uh, residents would actually had stopped eating as much so they were starting to see weight loss associated with this because they're starting to be depressed um, and feel you know not feel motivated to do that uh, they're you know not maybe able to do activities with other folks who are in the setting um, not being able to dine with them it's just a very isolating um, time for our nursing facility providers and so uh, if you know of these providers in your in your um, communities, I reach out and see if there's something you can do to help them with that. Um, the other part of that is really related to emotional and mental health status for the team members. So while the residents are going through this, the team members are very dedicated to trying to keep COVID out of the building, make sure that everybody is safe. They feel enormous pressure of serving to some degree as the family now for these residents because they're the only interaction that they may have. Um, and so that has been a big issue. And then isolation for residents with dementia. So when COVID uh, really came out, there were requirements that came out about having to isolate um, in place to wear a mask and all of these things. For folks with memory care issues, that was a big challenge because they didn't know why they were wearing a mask. They didn't know why their door was closed. And so there had to be some conversation around those things too. And then of course the handling of positive cases. So um, this is not something that nursing facilities are used to doing. Uh, it's new to everybody, obviously. It's new to nursing facilities, how to handle um, testing, how to handle actually care for positive cases, how to set up your facility differently. Um, those things have all been very challenging for our providers. So um, what can we do? What are the options? How do we fix it? Um, I wish I knew, but I have some ideas. So I have some ideas to share with you on that. Um, I do think that we have some opportunities I think that the folks who are on this call, uh, are on this training, are probably more in tune with these concerns and these issues. I think you may have a voice that can carry some of these messages in a more effective way. So um, I appreciate the work that you do, and my hope is that this will give you some ideas that will help you to carry a message on behalf of our seniors. Um, and here are some of the things that we have opportunities uh, in relation to. So number one, recognition of the value of our seniors and those who provide their care. Uh, I think that we fail a little bit in this, and I think that what we see is if your loved one is in a nursing facility, you're probably in tune with this. And if they're not, you probably aren't. And so we have a very limited group who's really engaging in trying to move forward this message. Um, and so maybe you don't have someone who's in a nursing facility, but you recognize this, or maybe you have before. Um, Keep that in mind as you hear these stories. Uh, one of the things that we continue to work on all of the time is uh, to advocate for increased reimbursement rates. Uh, those are specific to Medicaid. Our state legislatures uh, set and approve that budget. If you're interested and uh, you have a legislator who you are in contact with, or even if you don't, uh, please let them know that funding for senior care should be prioritized. Common sense approaches to policy and regulation. So um, if any of you are familiar with the survey process, uh, it has, for as long as I know, and I used to work in this area, been considered a pretty punitive approach. So it's, uh, it's been very um, regulatory, not very technical assistance. Um, some states do this a little differently. Uh, I think we really need to get to a point where we can implement a collaboration to care approach instead of a punitive approach so that we get people working together for the good of the seniors versus sort of this, um, the way things are going now. We have opportunities to train and expose high school students to long-term care and that career path. I know that's something that's available in some locations because uh, some students may be really interested in that. Um, we talked about workforce and the fact is 
If the people aren't there, you can't train them. So here's another option, uh, foreign workers uh, joining long-term care workforce. That's happened in a number of locations across the United States. It's been very successful. And the fact is you have to bring people in when they don't exist to do the work. And then innovation and the equipment and products used in the long-term care setting. So uh, being sure that you're using things that are effective, that will save your staff time, um, that will be most efficient and provide the highest quality to your residents um, is important and there are all kinds of things out there that help with that. Um, one other opportunity that I didn't put on here but I'm a big advocate for <laughs> is uh, actually critical access nursing homes. And I say that because we certainly have critical access hospitals because we realize that people in rural and frontier areas are going to need access to hospitals. And they might not be in every community, but they are space so that you can access them. Um, I, you know, the, the, uh, I wish I knew how to go backwards, but that map <laughs> with, that shows all of the black um, essentially really shows that there are a lot of areas in Nebraska where you can't have ready access and that it's going to be an issue. Um, and the way that critical access hospitals are paid, same thing. So I think that uh, recognizing that the continuum of care goes past hospital care, that there's long-term care that's necessary in those communities, reimbursing them in that same way, recognizing the need uh, for access are very important. So. Um, those are the things that I, I, I kind of swung past quickly for you today. If you have questions in regard to them, here's my contact information, my email. Um, and then I don't know, Madhvi, if we had any questions or... Okay. All right, great. Thank you.